Well, I'm Dub Dubs, tool users. Uh, we've got another episode. This is episode five of Rangers TV. Um, it's a bit of a reduced episode in one way, in that we've only got three bits of um, film for you this week. And I haven't got the studio sorted, so I'm in my lounge on my brown sofa. And uh, this is the first YouTube video after my move. And I've got like a whole house to myself now. So I've got a proper studio room that's been sorted out and a bedroom and a garden, which will lead on to one of the sections. And I've decided to start growing some fruit and veg. And I consider that to be a force multiplier, along with the other things that we've got planned for you over the next few episodes. We've got Graphen with uh, the whole treatise on compact mobile ham radios. And we'll be going more into amateur radio as the weeks and months go on and trying to bring you uh, an easy way to get into that. And uh, we've also got Kevin's EDC video. So I'm going to leave it at that. The three bits of footage will speak for themselves. We've got lots of cool things planned for you. Um, we'll be really ramping up the radio stuff. We'll be doing some agricultural bits and pieces and hopefully learning as we go. And uh, in the next few episodes, we'll have some more drone stuff. So I've invested in a, in a decent drone, hopefully with a good camera and we'll see what we can do with that. So lots of stuff to come. Thank you for bearing with us in the hiatus. Literally got told one morning without very much warning that I had to move, and I had to move on that. I had to move on getting somewhere else to live, getting to work, organizing all the stuff. I had to buy a whole bunch of stuff, like furniture, and washing machine, all the very boring things. And uh, we're back into doing fun stuff. Also, um, because this is the 17th of April, um, I'll be buying my EMF ticket, and if you're in the UK or if you're close to the UK, EMF camp is an amazing thing. It's being held at the end of August, beginning of September, and essentially it's a maker camp, but with a lot of partying, Wi-Fi to every tent and power and stuff like that. We're hoping to do like a whole bunch of really, really cool stuff there. So there'll be footage from that in, in September sometime. We've got drone footage coming up. We're going to try and do interesting things with FPV cameras. We've got the radio stuff coming up, including a very cheap way of building a Morse set. Um, we've got uh, other radio stuff that will be coming up. We'll be trying to build a Halo can, which is like a, an apocalypse box of stuff. We've got loads of EDC stuff, bought a load of stuff that uh, looks like it could be reviewed really interestingly. And uh, yeah, so we've got loads of stuff coming for you. We've got three bits of footage coming up, starting with Kevin's EDC video. Thanks very much for sending it in. I'd also like to say thank you to the, our, well, my Patreons, essentially, to Avagdu and Zoo Echoes. Thanks very much. There'll be a link to Patreon, and if you don't want to sign up to Patreon, I've also set up a PayPal me link, purely because it really helps to have some money to invest in getting new kit, making the show better, and stuff to review, because I don't really want to be in the pockets of anybody that will send us stuff necessarily. But if you are out there and you are a manufacturer of cool stuff and you think it'll fit with the show, feel free to send it in. As always, the email is v4v at earthling.net. So we're going to start with Kevin's video, Graffin's video, and uh, then a, a video about the uh, fruit and veg gardening. So, run VT. The subject of EDC or everyday carry has pretty much been done to death by near enough everybody. So I figured I'll do one too. This is my EDC bag. It is a Goruck GR1 in the 26 litre variant. Uh, I've customised it somewhat just to you know make it more like my bag basically. Starting from the top, got a Firefly marker from Wall Industries. It's a nice and glow in the dark thing. It uh, gives you an extra bit of grip on the handle and makes for easier identification of your bag, especially when in the dark. On the front Velcro section here, I've got three patches by Winson. Just again, more personalization. Uh, I have two reflective ruck straps, aka, you know leg straps or armbands for when you're running. Uh, they help increase visibility when you're out and about in a dark environment and it's currently winter. 
I have a bit of a commute across a dual carriageway and I'd rarely rather not get run over. So anything that helps is a good thing. Also, carabiner. It's a Goruk thing apparently, all Goruk bags are manda mandated to have a carabiner of some sort on them. I've also got a patch here from Law Industries, this is the Troll Cross, supposedly to help prevent against uh, malevolent magics and such like. Again, more personalisation. It's just on a bit of Velcro that I've attached to the Molly on the bag. The front of the bag has a small zipper pocket used for stashing you know, little bits of pieces that you need to be have accessible during your uh, day. I've used this for travelling internationally. Put your uh, phone and passport and whatnot in here when you're going through the metal detectors. Makes things nice and easy so you don't lose your kit. In the bag, uh, or in the pocket even, I have the book. Got uh, one of these, you know, shopping bags. It's, it's a shopping bag for extra stuff. I have some tea, coffee, whitener and the like, just you know, sometimes a hot drink is a really good morale boost uh, and just having this, it weighs nothing, takes up literally no space. Uh, I have keys from my parents' house, always good to have extra keys. I have tissues, which I need to replace with an actual fuller pack. And that's it. The rear of the bag has a quote, bomb proof unquote, laptop compartment. It's nice, right here. You've got good thick padding on the back here. There's a frame sheet as well, keeps the bag nice and rigid. And you've got loads of space in here for a laptop. I've got a 13 inch MacBook Pro just for example. You can see tucked right into the corner, you've still got all this space. I reckon you get a, at least a 15 or a 17 inch laptop in there no bother whatsoever. Moving to the inside of the bag where all the magic happens. The bag itself opens up completely flat so you can get easy access to all your stuff. I think I consider the most most important thing bottle of water. This is a 1.2 litre clean canteen. I've had this for a few years as you can see by the number of dings it's got on it. I absolutely loathe paying for water. It falls from the sky. Don't get bottled water. It's crap. Just use the stuff out your tap. Next up, because it's winter, I have a woolly scarf. Always good to have a scarf on you. And then when you're out and about, I usually have, uh, this is an empty bottle, a shaker bottle of Huel. I use Huel. It's basically, you know, Soylent made in Britain. Uh, 500 calories, job done, means you don't need to go get a crappy overpriced sandwich from some shop somewhere. Uh, there's a slot pocket or an expanding pocket in here, so you can put a laptop or a magazine or whatever. Uh, in this compartment we have, this is where I keep my first aid stuff. This is my primary first aid kit, uh, just got a bunch of useful stuff in there, mainly ibuprofen and paracetamol, but it's got plasters, tape, and, and you know other useful things. Always good to have first aid stuff on you. I have quick clot in case of you know really really bad trauma. An Israeli bandage again, really bad trauma. And I have a SWAT T uh, rubber tourniquet. It's basically just a giant rubber band uh, used to apply pressure to wounds. Also useful if you need to light a fire because rubber burns really well. In this compartment I have my notepad, field message pad, just you know all the stuff you need to be take notes and write with, but, uh, write in the rain pad in here. I've got pen, highlighter, you know that sort of stuff. I have my uh, electronic support kit, covered this in another video, always good to have. And lastly, simple soft shell jacket, packs down to nothing. It's always good to have that if, in case you get caught out. So that's it. I don't have a huge amount of stuff. I like to go with the pack light, move fast mentality. Don't want to be carrying 
loads and loads and loads of stuff to cover every eventuality. Chances are I'm not going to be particularly far from home or work, so if I need to get someplace, I can usually get there fairly quickly to where I've got the rest of my stuff stored. So yeah, that's my EDC. So communication is pretty important because we're not individuals on the majority scale. We are communal creatures. We have evolved to work with each other. And I mean, we can work on our own, but we were, we're better when we all work together. And communication is the best way of doing that. That's why we have language. That's why we have such strong, large, um, evolved languages. The angry monkeys with sticks need to call other angry man other angry monkeys to deal with the lion. Basically, yeah, we've grown. We've we've got the ability to talk across many things, across many topics for many reasons, um, and we've also um, created ways of talking to each other across or communicating ideas across long distances. I mean, like. Take the whistle, for example. That's not really something that occurs in nature. Um, I mean, you could say that you get some effect with wind blowing through trees, but having a device that has been crafted to create a certain tone, that is something that we've done ourselves expressly for communication. Communicating over any sort of distance is pretty important, so we have to think about what sort, what's the best way of communicating without there being anything for us to rely on other than power are handheld radios so and with the uh, influx of cheap reliable chinese radios we, uh, we've brought good close to intermediate distance communications well within the price range of any particular person and when we say intermediate distance we're talking like on a local level, so we're talking like uh, three or four miles, that would be an immediate distance, close distance would be anything up to two miles really, pushing it, um, less than a month, just under a mile in urban areas. Um, and with the radio, sort of radios like Bofongs, this is a UV5, UV5RE plus, a plus thing I wouldn't really worry massively about, but anything like, anything of the UV5R range is pretty good, but there's also the uh, UV5RTP, which is a tri-power radio, which means goes up to 8 watts of power. These is, they have like um, a low and a high, and for these it's like 1 watt for low, 5 watts for high. For the TP, it's got 3 power bands, low, medium and high, and low is 1 watt, medium is 5 watts, and high is 8 watts. And uh, this is a UV, UV8R which a little bit different to the Bofongs, it has two buttons for accessing the different channel selections. Now as you see these have all got, all these have got different antennas. This one's got a, what we call a bullet antenna, because it looks like a, a round from a, from a rifle, or a, well, a full round from a pistol. And, and this one, for its small size, is great for close range communications over UHF, ultra high frequency. This one is fantastic for that. Ultra high frequency you want for your close range communications, it's got enough power to punch through material and walls, but it drops off after a while, it's effective range. So you want to use it in urban areas. You can use it in clearer areas, but you just won't get the, you won't get the extra length, the extra distance. This is a whip antenna. And you can tell it's obviously a lot longer. This one is ideal for longer range communications on two meet on the ham two meter band, what we usually go on, um, and it'll in VHF, very high frequency, and this will go out three, four, five miles maybe if you if the elevation's good in the area. Obviously, if you're in a valley, that's going to be a problem, but uh, yeah. Antennas are useful. The like, the thing we would suggest is like when you buy a radio, one of these. It could be a Bofong, could be a Pofong, could be a Woshan. 
throw away the aerial it comes with, throw away the antenna it comes with and buy a separate antenna. Uh, these two antennas are from Diamond and they're pretty great. This one's a no-name one but it's better than the standard rubber duck that these come with. The antennas are supplied with are pretty terrible. Now what I've also got here, speaking of antennas, is a Slim Jim antenna. This is not something you can leave attached to your radio the whole time because as you can tell it's just essentially a ladder line you know the old radio hi-fis used to have these for connecting to FM and it's just a big old coil of it the idea is that you hang this from a tree get it up in the air and then you connect this end to your radio now this one's got a BNC connector because I've got a I've got a radio with a BNC connector on it, so I wanted to use that one with it. But you can get adapters to change these from the E. These are SMA. You can get the adapters to change them from SMA to BNC, etc. But the idea is you hang, have this hanging from a tree and then connect your radio to it. And having this in the... This is a, this is a better antenna than any of these that are connected to the radios. And having it elevated in the air makes it even better. If you don't need to elevate it, you can just like hold it up if you wanted to. We wouldn't wouldn't suggest it, but you could just hang it from something around about head height as long as it's you know hung. You're actually okay. Um, and this I just got off of eBay, and it's been fantastic. Great antenna. I've been able to get close to 20 miles on two meters. On at five watts with this antenna, it is absolutely fantastic. But again, you you have to like weigh up um, efficiency with usability in the field. So clearly, an antenna like this is highly is way more efficient than this one, or this one, or this one. However, it is not usable on the move. You need what to use this. You need to stop and set it up. You cannot just be moving with it and make a call. Whereas with these ones, oh yep, yeah, no, I can make a call like this. I don't have to stop. So the price of these radios is like incredibly cheap. Um, the low end of what we would consider low end. There are cheaper ones, but this is the UV5 RES, or we would consider to be the the beginner radios. They're about you can probably maybe you'll, maybe you'd be lucky to find them for fifteen dollars. Um, this one cost me about twenty dollars. Uh, the re antennas obviously are about ten dollars extra. Usually, usually your antennas are about twenty ten to twenty dollars extra. Um, the this UV5 RTP was about $40. Um, this UV5 R8 was about $40. So the, although this one doesn't isn't tri-power, it's got much better build quality than the 5 REs. The 5 REs are a bit flimsy, which is why we consider them base entry for beginner radios. But the UV5 R8s are a bit better well-made. Um, what you'll find on all of these, and I'll take this off because this is going to be wiggling in front of the camera, is that on all of these they've got an accessory socket for ancillaries like a headset or a fist mic or a data cable um, for programming them. They've all got a... If I can find it... No. They all have a flashlight. Which will do just a standard light and also a sort of SOS flashing kind of. It doesn't do Morse, but it's flashing. You'll let people know where you are. Um, and they also have FM radio, which goes from, I think, like... Go all the way down from in the 70s megahertz all the way up to the... Something like 120 megahertz. Um, oh, it goes from 65 to 108 megahertz, 
which is fantastic. And you know, you might think, oh, well, why do we need an FM radio? Well, FM radio is like really good to have on one of these because if there is an emergency, you kind of want to be listening out for like the radio broadcasts. And considering that, like FM, FM is not the best for getting like to everywhere in the country. It requires a lot of power. It requires a lot of infrastructure to do like national FM broadcasting. It is the most used in all countries. Like the amount of AM broadcasters has dropped drastically, and the amount of AM radios that people have, which used to be the standard, is dropped as well. Not many people have AM radios. Pretty much everyone has an FM radio, either in their car or at home. These radios, in context of PMR radios, uh, FRS radios, uh, GMRS radios. These are way more powerful, way more reliable, way more efficient than the PMRs or FRS or GMRS radios. Um, the problem is, is that you can't really use these legally without an amateur radio license. So you have to weigh up your options there. But... Ideally, these are, well, but these are way better. And you can theoretically tune these to the PMR bands. Of course, in an emergency situation, all these rules go out of the window, which is why we actually really like these radios. Because they're cheap enough that for emergency communications that no one's really going to mind if you're using them in an emergency on the hand bands. No one's really going to care. No one's going to care if you're using these on the PMR bands in an emergency. So, uh, for example, on the on this radio, on all my radios, I have it, them programmed to have the uh, eight PMR channels at the start, because there's eight PMR channels, and from then on, some phones that I like, so my local repeater is in this, but then we go into the designated ham channels, because there are some designated ham channels in VHF and UHF, VHF being 2 meters, the 2 meter band, UHF being the 70 centimeter band, and there are some designated international channels, and we've got them programmed into here, because it makes moving around the frequencies a lot easier if there's an emergency, or even just using them for their license purpose, it makes finding an area to talk really easy, because, you know, if you need to talk to someone, you don't really want to be saying, oh, well, I'll call you up on 145.725 megahertz. You can say, all right, I'll call you up on VHF 20. And there you go. No one's really going to know if you're using them, using these outside of the bands. Because you need like really sophisticated equipment to know. Some people might be able to guess that you're using them outside of the bands. Like you're not supposed to use these on PMR, but you can. What we suggest if if you were going to use them on PMR, use them on the low power so people don't get as suspicious quickly. Um, we do recommend that in an emergency situation you, you try and. You try not to use the PMR stuff because they'll get swamped by everyone who's going to only thought to get PMR radios. Try and use them in the handbands. Um, pick a ham, a ham frequency to stick on, stick on it, um, and use it there. These these are like so versatile. These radios, for the price, we recommend that everyone has at least two. Uh, one for yourself and one for some daft apeth, some doofus who totally forgot to get one. So, with the move that delayed all production, once I got the studio set up, naturally, um, I moved to a new place, and it's got a new shopping centre, and there's lots of um, discount stores, possibly because the local economy is failing, but that's an even better reason to do this. So, um, now I've got a garden, I've decided to cover one of the major top, well, the top one of all survival skills, and that's growing your own food. 
If you've got shelter sorted, the next thing is water followed by food. Got a river near me, so that's fairly sorted. We'll go into that in a later show. But uh, I wanted to grow some vegetables and, you know, literally get my hands dirty and try and uh, literally start growing my own food. The local discount stores have got all sorts of fruit and veg to grow. I don't really want to grow flowers because I don't see the point. So um, I bought some seed trays, some seeds, some seed potatoes and some onion sets and some um, fruit shrubs. So what I intend to do this year in a multi-part series is grow my own, some of my own food and see whether um, if you buy it at a pound store or a, or a cheap outlet, can you save money by growing food for yourself? And even if I don't, um, I'll have at least got a, a viable skill. So the seed packets were sort of like one to two pounds or less than a pound in some cases. And Poundland was selling um, bags of potato tubers and onion sets for a pound as well as fruit trees for a pound. So I bought some seed trays, little pots, some compost, um, and uh, just got everything running. Got about 11 varieties of different food. I only bought stuff that I was actually going to eat. I bought some short stem carrots so I can grow them in pots and uh, bought myself a greenhouse. Jump cut. Ooh. So yeah, a big um, four foot by six foot greenhouse. And I've put that in the garden and I'll be starting off everything in there, putting all the pots in there. I've since found out that uh, I can't grow stuff in the, the coconut fibre compost that I bought. So I'm going to have to get some more compost. And uh, yeah, that's just a quick run through. We'll do a shot of the constructed greenhouse. It took me about half an hour to put together. So I figured that was a good use of my time. And yeah, I'll see if I can use my allotment growing experience to grow some food. And we'll follow that over the next few weeks and yeah well let's just do that so this is the greenhouse it took about half an hour to put up i thought it was extremely good value given the space it will grow and especially in with the spring that we've been having um it should make a lot of difference to growing the vegetables or at least getting them started so they can go outside and uh as you can see, not a huge garden, but certainly some space to uh, put some pots out and grow some veg and fruit, as well as do other things. Yeah. So yeah, it looks comfortable for the plants. It's got a couple of shelves in it, didn't take long to put together, and was very, very cheap. Certainly a lot cheaper than buying a glass greenhouse. What I really like is that the uh, the side material is very ripstop so even if it does get a puncture it's not going to tear very quickly and I'm seriously thinking on this side which is kind of like dead light putting some mylar blankets up just to reflect all the light and maybe some mylar blankets on the ground just to increase the amount of light that's in here but since they're about 50p each I don't think that'll be a problem but I can certainly see that where you've got areas that aren't going to be very good for light like this against this fence here it'd be certainly a very good idea to you know just tape some mylar to these top supports so we'll come back to this when everything's planted up and potted up <laughs> 